It's TV school time. Number of by TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic is Knoxville. Your teachers are Herb Hake and Irving Hart of Iowa State Teachers College. Hello, boys and girls. I just found a piece of red rock. Came right off this bluff back here. This is the red rock it's called red rock because this whole bluff here is made up of red sandstone and it's quite red it's as red as brick if this were color television you could see that this is a red rock that i'm holding in my hand now the announcer said that we were at knoxville but we're really a little north of knoxville this is near the settlement of red rock on Iowa 14 that goes north from Knoxville to Marshalltown. And this red rock, of which this is a piece, was at one time the westernmost limit of white settlement. And Mr. Hart is going to tell you about that in a minute. But first, I'd like to have you take a look at this red rock and compare it with an ordinary rock. Here is a piece of ordinary rock that I picked up somewhere else. And if I hold the two together, you can see that this one here, which I'm moving, is the red rock and how much darker it is than the other piece. You see, this is just an ordinary piece of sandstone, this piece that I'm rubbing with my thumb here. See how much darker it is? If I put one on top of the other, it's almost a difference of night and day, isn't it? Well, this is the red rock. And this made an, a convenient place to mark a line because there is only one place on the Des Moines River where this red rock is to be found. And so when this line was drawn across the map, it went right spang through this red sandstone bluff and went south all the way to the Missouri border. Let me show you where that line was. I have the map already set up over here and I have a brand new pointer. Isn't that a beauty? Mr. Bork, our director in Ames, sent this pointer to me. He said that the pointer I had been using was so thick at least ball bat whenever I used it on the map. So let's see how this one is going to look. Oh my, isn't that nice? See how thin and graceful that is? Well, this line right here is the Red Rock Line. And it got this name because it goes right through this Red Rock Bluff here on the Des Moines River. This bluff is on land owned by Mr. Joe Templeton. And Mr. Templeton and his son and son-in-law worked the land of the farm. Of course, there isn't any growing to be done on this red rock itself, but there is some fine farmland beside it. And then you see the line goes through the edge of Knoxville. This is Knoxville, this white spot here. And the line went right straight south all the way to the Missouri border. Now you'll notice on this map there are some other dotted lines. And all of those lines represent lines that separated the white settlers from the Indians. And they were put there by treaties. The historian at the Iowa State Teachers College. I'm always glad to have Mr. Hart with me. Will you tell the boys and girls about that, Mr. Hart? Very glad to. The boys and girls, uh, before... 1832, the time of the Black Hawk War, all Iowa was Indian land. Uh, there were no white settlements except to that up at uh, uh, Dubuque. You've heard about Dubuque settlement up there. And all the rest of it was uh, Indian land. Then as a result of the Black Hawk War, in which the uh, Saxon foxes led by Black Hawk were defeated, uh, they were uh, compelled to give up a tract of land west of the river. And this area in here, bounded on the west by this uh, line, is the, uh, the part of Iowa, the early Iowa, which was known as the first Black Hawk Purchase. Then, uh, some years later, about five years later, a second Black Hawk Purchase was made, which added uh, to the, the original area this part in here 
But when the first uh, treaty of, uh, station was made, a reservation of uh, 400 square miles was made on both sides of the Iowa River for Keokuk and his band of Saxon foxes. Keokuk, you may remember, did not join in the uh, war against the white men. He was given that, uh, that land. Well, now later, in 1837, uh, this reserve was bought from the Indians by the United States government. I never could remember figures, but I, I think I've got the, the, what the government paid for that, yes. The government paid Keokuk and his band $178,000, $178,458.87 and a half cents. 87 and a half cents? 87 and a half cents. Why that uh, fraction in there? You ever heard of a bit? Oh, you mean like in two bits? Two bits? Two bits is a quarter. Six bits is 75 cents. Well, this was seven bits. <laughs> seven bits is 87 and a half cents? That's 87 and a half cents. That's the old shilling. How'd they happen to figure it that close? Uh, probably because all of these treaties of purchase involved the payment of debts that the Indians had acquired uh, uh, to the traders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose some sack or fox Indian had bought something that cost him seven bits. <laughs> well, in 1842, uh, the pressure of white movement west became so uh, serious that the government made another treaty with the Saxon foxes, this time involving their session of all that they owned in Iowa. All of this land lying between this line on the east and this line on the west. But uh, in order to make it uh, uh, a little easier on the Indians, the treaty provided that this line, this red rock line that Mr. Haig spoke of, uh, should be the boundary for white settlements until 1845. And on uh, the night of the 12th of October, 1845, the white people who had moved clear up here and uh, were waiting for the signal, uh, they were uh, given permission by the soldiers of the United States Army to cross over and settle this part of Iowa. And this part of Iowa, by the way, would include what the part where we are uh, today at uh, Red Rock, and would include the area, the land on which WOITV stands at Ames. This western boundary was the, uh, the boundary between the two river systems. To the east of that are the rivers which flow uh, to into the Mississippi and to the west are those that flow into the, into the Missouri. Later, by later treaties, uh, this territory to the west was secured by treaties with the Potawatomi's and the Sioux, and by 1851, the Indian had given up all claim uh, to uh, the land in Iowa. They got for it varying amounts. The first uh, uh, Black Hawk purchase, uh, the uh, amount per acre was about 10 cents. In the second Black Hawk purchase, it was about 30 cents. Land had gone up in the meantime in those five years. I, uh, I'd like to buy some of that land over in there, even at 30 cents uh, an acre. How much do you suppose you'd get? Oh, a handful. I think I could probably put 30 cents worth of that land in my pocket. <laughs> I'm sure you could. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hart. Thank you for returning this beautiful pointer that uh, Mr. Bork sent me. I think this is a wonderful pointer. I hope I don't break it in the course of the year. Very, very thin and fragile and very dainty. Now, let me show you some pictures that I took last summer. It's always better to take pictures in the summer than it is in the winter time, or even when the weather is cool as it is now. And so, in making preparations for all of these programs in the Landmarks series, I usually go to these places in the summer and take pictures when the leaves are on the trees and everything looks nice and the light is good. And then, of course, I make arrangements at that time to have the program at the time that it is scheduled for the TV school time series. So let's look at some of these pictures that I took last summer. Here is a view of the Des Moines River as you see it from this bluff in front of which we're standing today. Now, the Des Moines River is not much of a river. And at the time I took this picture, the water was very low 
And you can see all this sandy beach here. This goes all the way up to the bluff, which is on this side over here, and it's outside the picture. But it would be back of this line here that I'm indicating with the pointer. And the, the bluff in front of which we're standing can't be seen in this picture. But notice how narrow this stream is. It's just a creek, and it'd be very easy just to wade across it. At times, when the Des Moines River is in flood, all of this is covered. And many years ago, this was quite a torrent, and it was a big enough river to cut away this red rock which forms the bluff in front of which we're standing. In the courthouse square in Knoxville is this stone which was placed there by the Mary Marion chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And this bronze plaque on here tells about the Red Rock Line. I don't think you can read it on the screen there, so I'll read it for you. As white men advanced their habitations across Iowa, they were retarded from 1842 to 1846 at the Red Rock Line, fixed by the Indian Treaty at the Agency in Wapalo County, 1842. This line was established and marked by George W. Harrison in 1842 by beginning at Red Rock on the Des Moines River, running thence south to the Missouri State Boundary, passing near the Graceland Cemetery, west from this stone, 530 rods. And this bronze marker was erected by the Mary Marion chapter of the DAR. Now, several times in the course of this series, I have remarked upon the fact that the DAR has preserved many of the landmarks and has placed bronze markers at the sites of landmarks. We are greatly indebted to the DAR for doing this because otherwise many of our historic sites would no longer be seen and we wouldn't even know where they were at one time. And the Mary Marion chapter of the DAR in Marion County has done a great deal to preserve important landmarks throughout that county. And I'm grateful to the chapter for having made it possible to find so many of these places that we are showing you today. In the post office in Knoxville, there is this mural above the door which enters the postmaster's office. This is not a picture of the postmaster's family. This is a picture of the settlers who crossed the Red Rock Line at midnight on October 12, 1845, and staked their claims to the new land which the Indians had vacated. And here you see a man holding a pine torch as another man, a farmer, unloads a moldboard plow. And there's a great deal of excitement here. The horses are almost stampeding because of all the excitement. Here's a boy here who is looking on in wonder as all these things are happening. Here is a child who has just awakened by all the noise, and the mother is trying to comfort the child. Here's another farmer who is handing out a stake that is to be driven in the ground to mark the claim. And there must have been a great deal of excitement like this after midnight when the line was abolished. Of course, this line was an imaginary line. It's easy enough to draw a line on the map, but I imagine it was very difficult to actually know where that line actually was on the ground at the time that the line was abolished by law. But they had a pretty good idea, and they were all lined up there at midnight on October 12, 1845, and then a gun sounded, and people in wagons dashed across to the west and staked out their claims by the light of torches. Here is another historic site marked by the Marion chapter of the DAR. This is a marker on Iowa 14 on the way to Red Rock. It's about halfway between Knoxville and Red Rock. And this marker, which was dedicated in June of 1957, has this message. Here passed the Dragoon Trail, blazed in 1835 by the first U.S. Dragoons under Colonel Stephen W. Kearney. D.A.R., June 11, 1957. And as you drive into Knoxville, either from the east or the west, you will see a sign like this. 
Welcome to Knoxville, birthplace of the Iowa flag. Have you ever seen that flag before, boys and girls? That is the official state flag of Iowa. Designed by Mrs. Dixie Gebhardt, who lived in Knoxville. And here is a picture of Mrs. Gebhardt. I'm indebted to Mrs. John Rorda, who lives near Knoxville, for permission to use this picture. This is a copy of the picture that Mrs. Rorda has. Mrs. Rorda and Mrs. Gebhardt were both very active in the Marion chapter of the DAR, and this picture, the original of this picture, was autographed by Mrs. Gebhardt to Mrs. Rorda, who was a very good friend. This is Mrs. Gebhardt, who was at one time the state regent of the DAR. And in 1917, the members of the Iowa Guard, who were stationed on the Mexican border, wrote back to Iowa and said, all the other state regiments have flags. We don't even have a flag. In order to identify our regimental headquarters, we have to put up just a sign saying Iowa. And these soldiers said, why can't we have a flag? And Mrs. Gebhardt, who was regent of the DAR, state regent of the DAR at that time, said, we should have a flag. And so she sent out word to all the chapters in Iowa asking for suggestions. And when these came in, Mrs. Gebhardt sat down and put all these ideas together, plus her own ideas, and designed the Iowa flag, the Iowa state flag. That was in 1917. Four years later, in 1921, the Iowa General Assembly voted to make this flag design the official Iowa state flag. And so, to Mrs. Gebhardt goes the credit for designing the Iowa state flag, and Knoxville, which was her hometown, is known as the birthplace of the Iowa flag. Here is the house at 409 West Montgomery Street in Knoxville, where Mrs. Gebhardt lived. And here, in 1955, she had a very serious fall and injured her hip and died shortly afterward at the age of 88. And at her funeral, her casket had the Iowa flag, which she had designed, placed upon it. Here is a replica, or an exact model of the original design of the Iowa State flag that hangs in the Belknap Museum. This is a room at the back of the Belknap Jewelry Store in Knoxville, off the square there in Knoxville. And Mr. Belknap has made a back room available for an historical museum. This particular flag was given to Mrs. Rorda, and Mrs. Rorda in turn has loaned it to the Belknap Museum so that it may be displayed there and many people may see it and take pride in the fact that Knoxville is the home or the birthplace of the Iowa flag. The flag itself, that is the original flag, may be seen in the Iowa State Historical Building in Des Moines. So when you go to Des Moines, you look for the original Iowa flag. Mr. Hart, I uh, almost forgot that the uh, you are a former resident of Knoxville, is that right? That is correct. I lived there when I was about 10 years old. Well, you don't uh, remember a great deal about it, I suppose. Uh, my most vivid recollection of Knoxville is the fact that we had three coasting hills, and we had a name uh, for each of them. One was Greasy, one was Slippery, and one was Bumpy. <laughs> I suppose Greasy was the best uh, hill to use if you wanted to go yeah. fast. Yes, suppose those hills right. are still there? I imagine the hills are there. I don't know whether the names are still attached to them or not. Well, Better ask a 10-year-old boy in Knoxville. All right. We'll make some inquiries before we go back to Cedar Falls. How large was Knoxville at the time you were living there? Oh, a 10-year-old boy <coughs> doesn't know much about population. <coughs> I should, it was the county seat. I should uh, guess it had 1,500 to 2,000 people. Well, it's quite a bit larger now. But even then, it was larger than it was back in 1846, let's say. Yes, I... Uh, I picked up a very interesting book that came to me from the State Historical Society just this week. It's called A Glimpse of Iowa in 1846. The year Iowa was admitted to the Union. 
And uh, the writer uh, tells something about Marion County and about Knoxville. Maybe you boys and girls be interested in having a description of Knoxville in 1846. Knoxville is the seat of justice of Marion and is situated within one mile of the geographical center on a high ridge of prairie. It has just commenced improving and presents a favorable and promising appearance. A merchant or two would do well to locate in Knoxville as there was not in April last a store in the county and what is still more remarkable, but one lawyer. They had more than that when you were there. Uh, decidedly more. I don't know whether the author thought that was an advantage or a disadvantage. <laughs> well, it was frontier country in those days. I suppose people would take law into their own hands pretty much, and uh, one lawyer could take care of most things. By the way, when you were living there as a boy, was there mining activity in Marion County? Yes, that was my first experience of living in uh, uh, if they, uh, a place where there were mines. And... Uh, I remember very vividly one uh, afternoon, a group of us boys stood on the, the sidewalk and watched a wagon come by where, which carried the body of a man, a miner who had just been killed in a, a fall of slate. Oh, my. I suppose safety devices were not as common then as they, they are, are now. Certainly not. But Mr. Hart, you're a veteran of World War I, and uh, that's about the time when the Iowa State flag was uh, designed. Do you have any recollection of seeing the Iowa State flag used by any of our soldiers in World War I? I don't remember having seen it, and I doubt very much whether the Iowa State flag uh, was displayed in any uh, army camp in the First World War. I suppose it was too early and it hadn't been adopted yet. Well, boys and girls, I know many of you have seen the Iowa State flag, but I would like to call your attention to it again today since we are talking about the lady who designed it, and I'd like to ask Mr. Hart to tell something about the symbolism of the flag. Here is a three by five state flag which I borrowed from Latta's, a store in Cedar Falls, which sells the Iowa state flag. This is about the size that you would use on a flagpole, and of course this would always be displayed under the flag of the United States. The flag of the United States on top, and then this one down below. Uh, will you describe this flag to the boys and girls, Mr. Hart? Well, boys and girls, this uh, flag means several things. In the first place, uh, it uh, indicates that when Iowa land came, became a part of the United States, it belonged to France, because this flag is a reproduction of the French tricolor, the blue, white, and red. Not red, white, and blue. Blue, white, and red. And uh, in the center, we have uh, taken from the Iowa State Seal, the eagle, uh, with the streamers in his beak, which have our uh, state motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. And uh, uh, another thing which we remember from all of the, uh, the flags which have these three colors is that the blue stands for loyalty, the white for purity, and the red for courage. Fine. Thank you very much, Mr. Hart. Now, boys and girls, if you do not have an Iowa State flag in your school, I hope that you'll get one. It isn't just because we happen to be in Knoxville today and that we're telling you the story about Mrs. Gebhardt, who designed it, but I think every school should have an Iowa State flag as well as a United States flag. Show your pride in the fact that you are citizens of Iowa. Now let's have a little review with our chalkboard. Mr. Hart told you the story of the Red Rock Line, the fact that it was held by the Indians until midnight of October 12, 1845. In a way, this line was something like a football line. The Indians were holding that line and the white settlers were hitting the line. Of course, the outcome was never in doubt. It wasn't like a football game in that respect, because everybody knew who would win. But let's just assume that this was a sort of a football game. Let's draw a, a football player here who is about to hit that line. This is a fullback. 
just about as full of back as I can draw here. See, he's kneeling down. You can see that his pants there. And here are his hands on either side of him. And here is his head. He's just about ready to hit that line. And here is a spike back in here. And here is the grass digging his feet in. Now, of course, all of us know who lost this game. But let's, uh, let's see if we can get a little different picture of it. Remember, the Indians were holding that line, and the white settlers were hitting that line. And after we add a few more lines here, and turn the whole thing over, we'll see who lost the game. See, the Indians lost the game. They were unable to hold that line. And the history of Iowa tells about many such games in which the Indians tried to hold one line after another. And the government came along and said, no, we'll have to move you back a little further west. And the land was purchased. Sometimes it was paid for in full. Sometimes they paid on it for a year or two and then forgot about paying the Indians any more money. All we need to remember is that the Indians, by slow degrees, were pushed back, 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 back until they were completely out of Iowa. And that's a very interesting story. I'm sorry we don't have time to tell it to you completely, but there's been a series of these lines, each one of which has been lost through the course of Iowa history. The other thing that we emphasize today was the Iowa State flag, which of course was designed much later than the Red Rock Line was abolished. But I think we might remember something about that too. Remember Mr. Hart told you about the eagle from the state seal, which is at the center of the design. Well, here is the eagle. Now, the eagle is also a symbol of the United States. Of course, the eagle is on the United States seal. But we're concerned about it here because it is the figure on the state seal. Now, how can we remember which is which? Well, this eagle, which is on the state flag and on the state seal, can be considered to be a symbol of the Iowa farmer. Here is the Iowa farmer. And the Iowa farmer doesn't look very happy here either, does he? Maybe he didn't get very much for his corn. Almost looks as unhappy as the, as the Indian a moment ago. But of course he isn't. The Iowa farmer is in a much better situation than the Indian ever was. And has much more wealth and is likely to keep it. Next week, boys and girls, we're going to Nauvoo, Illinois. And we're going to see the place which was left by the Mormons when they began their trek across Iowa in 1846. Until next week, goodbye. Today your teacher has been Herb Hake and Irving Hart of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa history is produced for Iowa TV school time by WOY TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. The TV School Time is presented daily Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.